Okay, um, one of the books that I used to require uh, is Constricting the Sexual Crucible by, by uh, David Snarch. Um, I haven't required it for, for a while for this class because uh, I think we can cover some of the main ideas and it's a pretty expensive book and I think we can get to the highlights without having you to have to buy it. Um, anyways, um, this is one of those things that I think is interesting because uh, it sort of revolutionized for me how uh, sex therapy is approached. It's very different from some of the earlier earlier models, and I'll try and highlight some of those with you. So one of the main concepts from this approach is the idea of a crucible. There are two definitions of a, of a crucible. Uh, one is that it is a severe test or a hard trial. Another one comes from chemistry. Uh, Im the image of one is below. It's a, it's a vessel. It's a highly non-reactive vessel in which uh, actually it can withstand great heat. And so you can put, you can put different chemicals in there. And then uh, because it can withstand such great heat, a transfiguring process can, can take place. Both of those ideas kind of have some relevancy for, uh, for relationships. You've probably experienced relationships as a as a severe test or hard trial, or uh, as a place, as, as, as an experience where things can get really heated, but through that process, um, a lot of transformation can, can, can take place. Some of the basic tenets of a crucible approach is one that rather than what, what a lot of the older models did is they tried to find ways to decrease anxiety. Uh, what this model does is try to help people to increase their, their anxiety tolerance rather than to avoid anxiety. And then it focused on potential rather than just dysfunction. So even a couple that might be doing well um, might benefit from this approach because it's the idea that there's always somewhere more to go. It addresses sort of the two-choice dilemma. Like sometimes we'll have clients that come to us and they will ask to change, but they want to stay the same. So, uh, you know, wanting a choice between anxiety and no anxiety, wanting two choices, but really only getting one. It's, it's helping people, to, really it's helping people to sort of face the things that they're avoiding and then recognize it as a, as a gift that can lead to, to better things. Think about it in your own lives. Probably everything that has ever been good in your life also had some anxiety tied to it. Most positive things require different, uh, a degree of anxiety, whether that's attending graduate school, whether that's uh, starting a new relationship, whether that's the birth of a, of a child, all of those things that le can lead to a lot of growth probably have a, a level of anxiety with that. So um, it's sort of a reframing of, of what anxiety is. There's probably negative anxiety. There is negative anxiety. But most anxiety is actually can be a, a, a sort of an impetus uh, uh, to, to something better. It's the idea that everyone has a differentiation edge. I'll talk more about differentiation in a moment. But the, it's, it's the idea that there's a next step pushing the envelope towards greater emotional, spiritual, physical, sexual connection. The crucible approach is the opposite, again, of many approaches, which focus on decreasing or bypassing anxiety or discomfort. So like when I'm talking with a couple, um, I, might be say, I might say something like, when you're going through hell, don't stop. Like uh, you, go, you go toward it, you go through it, and, and with the idea that on the other side, there can be better things. This has been true of my own, my own lived experiences. I think sometimes those very difficult moments. You can't see it at the time, but they can actually lead to, to better things in your life. It's the, the idea that there's different entry points um, between differentiation, intimacy, and sexuality. So the sexual crucible is a treatment approach that utilizes the recursive relationship between intimacy, intimacy, sexuality, or differentiation in order to facilitate all three. Now, my own take on this is I see these as clinical entry door entry points where if I can help a person with differentiation, that might in improve their sexuality and intimacy. Or maybe sometimes that's easier to help someone with their uh, sexual functioning, and that can lead to di greater differentiation and intimacy. So uh, it's, it's the idea that work where you can most easily affect change. Differentiation. You probably are familiar with this concept, but just a, a brief review. Um, it's the ability to differentiate and integrate two fundamental drives. We all have a drive for attachment, to be connected. We also have a drive to, for self-regulation, where we have our in, in, independence. Um, we're trying to help 
help people find some sort of balance between them. Now, differentiation is distinguishing and balancing self-regulation and emotional attachment by going through relationship struggles that teach you the difference between these two. So this often gets confused. It is sometimes that people who have been overly enmeshed, when they're working on differentiation, they can go to the opposite extreme and just cut off. That is basically the same thing. It's not a higher level of differentiation. You want to help people find that middle place where they can be connected to others and also maintain their individuality. Some other aspects of differentiation, it is a clear sense of self and close proximity to important people in your life. So um, you still remember who you are when you're around people uh, that, that are important to you. It is the ability to self-regulate uh, your own anxiety and self-soothe your own hurts. So it's really different than maybe how we're socialized by media, for example, where we think the other person's going to take care of all of our emotional needs and help uh, and make us feel better. It's, it's taking more responsibility for that. It's being non-reactive to the anxiety of significant people in your life. So if your partner's upset, do you have a choice whether or not you're upset? The more differentiated you are, the more you would be able to have that, that ability to choose what, what emotional response you want to be having. It's the ability to tolerate discomfort for growth. Like it might involve the ability to be able to have direct and open conversations, even though it may, it may be create anxiety for you. You can tolerate that discomfort. Whenever I hear someone say to me, you know, um, I would never do that because they would be too upset. What I really hear is that they cannot yet uh, tolerate the discomfort that comes from um, having over honest conversations or whatever it is. It's self-regulation of emotionality so that judgment can be used. So um, it's, it's calming things down enough uh, emotionally so that you can think things through and make, uh, make good decisions. It is the ability for intense involvement without becoming infected with other people's anxiety. So it is, again, not, not cutting off or not caring uh, or not being connected to. It's not any of those things. It's being intensely connected but not being um, infected with whatever the other person's emotion is. It is the absence of the need to withdraw or to interfere with a partner to modulate one's own emotionality. Like when people say, I need to go off and find myself. Um, you know, we usually get to know, uh, know ourselves better when we're in relationship with, with, with others. So I can stay connected to, to someone else while I'm working on my own, my own issues. Again, it is not the absence of empathy or understanding. Um, in undifferentiated relationships in contrast, are characterized by cycles of enmeshment and flight. So you probably, if you're seeing clients, have had clients where, oh, I absolutely love this person. Oh, I hate this person. Or I, want, I, I need to be around them all the time. Or I don't want to ever see, see them. You know, it's those that's going to those extremes. Uh, differentiated is a much more balanced space. Um, it's kind of tied to, Snarch talks about uh, two levels of, of intimacy. The first one's probably the one we're all familiar with. It's the one portrayed in the media. So it's the expectation of reciprocity and the validation of one's self-image and self-worth. Sort of like if a relationship was a mirror, we look in it and we see reflected back to us that we are beautiful, lovely people. Like I might look in the mirror and think, ah, I'm so sexy, this bald guy and all this. What? Uh, but uh, it, it's only the first level um, of, of, of intimacy. Second level is a little more difficult. It's the ability to self-disclose and to self-validate in the absence of validations or the presence of, presence of disconfirmation. So, so you re get reflected back not only the positive things about you, but maybe the things that aren't so, so wonderful. So maybe you think of yourself as a super kind person, but your, per your partner is reflecting back to you ways that you're not kind. Um, and then you're faced with a choice. Like you can, you can break the mirror so that um, the, that part doesn't get reflected back to you. But if you only stay at a level one, you're, you're missing out on depth in, in a relationship. Some people get addicted to, to level one intimacy. And really the only way to maintain that is to have a new relationship every, every once in a while, every, you know, every few weeks. Um, but you miss out on a lot, uh, the deeper, more sort of uh, connected intimacy. So pop quiz, is this, is this an example? I know these are things that you don't want to hear, but I'm enjoying the hell out of saying them. 
No, it's not. Because uh, in, a, in, in this approach, it's, it's not about being hurtful. It's about being honest and being known. You know, a lot of times people are in relationships, but they're putting on this fake facade. And so they never feel known by the other person. So it's trying to av avoid that. When I am close, I know you. But when I'm intimate, that second level of intimacy, then I know myself. Um, so that's something that sort of captures it for me. Some, another way that, that, that this model approaches things is it sees sexuality as an elicitation window. A couple's sexual behaviors, including style and content, included or excluded, can become a window into the whole of their partner's individual functioning or their relationship. Um, a couple sexual or an individual sexual style is a natural occurring window into current adjustment, contemporary life concerns, or unresolved emotional development. So like you will learn a lot about a person's like maybe, okay, I'm trying to think of a good example. When an, maybe as a, as a child, um, you were um, always sort of entitled and you were given everything that you, you, you want. And then as a, an adult in a relationship, maybe you've recreated that, that you're getting all of your needs met. Uh, and then you've matched up with someone who's maybe in childhood, they were neglected and they didn't get their needs met. And so one partner, like if we went back to the ISS, maybe this, the first partner in that scenario would, would say that they have a great sex life. And then maybe their partner would report that they have a very unsatisfying sex, sex life. Because these patterns that that, uh, that begin in early earlier in life has now have now been replicated in the adult couple relationship. A couple sexual relationship contains depictions of their lives, sort of a metaphorical construction, not unlike dreams. Like there's not there's not any, any inherent meaning uh, in in what acts are included or not included. So, for example, if a couple doesn't have oral sex, there's no innate meaning in that. But you by having conversations with them, you may realize the ways that that restriction in the relationship is uh, an expression of, of some other patterns. Um, like you may find out that similar patterns that are going on in the couple's sexual relationship are being replicated in how they go about parenting or how they discuss finances. Like for example, maybe in all three of those scenarios, one person has, has more say, uh, than the other one. That's just an example. But the good thing about this is an elicitation approach also implies that latent unresolved problems of the individual, the dyad, or the extended emotional system can be evoked and resolved through sele selective prescriptions and proscriptions of sexual and non-sexual interactions. Another way of saying that is, uh, if you can help people resolve some of the, the dilemmas that they have in their sexual functioning, Sometimes that can also help them resolve their parenting issues or their uh, finance issues or whatever else, because it's, it's different content areas, uh, but the, but the um, process is the same in each of those. So that's one of the ideas behind this. So some of the strategies with this is first, assist individuals to move toward important others. So you're trying to help people go toward uh, the, their partners, uh, generally in this scenario. It's helping them to talk from the very best in themselves uh, and to talk to the solid part of the partner. Like we've all had moments where we talk from the worst in ourselves to the worst in our partners. This is how, how, trying to get us through the other. Like sometimes I might say to a client, you know, I know it feels good. Sometimes it feels good to, to really tear down your partner because you're angry and, and that feels um, you know, it feels good to be able to, to, to destroy them. But if your long-term goal is to have greater connection with them, then that's a short-term win because it, it is actually getting in the way of your, your goal to have a better relationship. Um, I help them realize that a point of dis disconnection can be, become a point of connection, especially in sex. So if, if it's a couple and they're having uh, one of the, individuals in that couple is having problems having an orgasm. They may come to you ac absolutely devastated, but if you can uh, help them see this as uh, a crucible that they're going to go through, they may end up being closer and more intimate and more connected uh, through the process of addressing that issue than they ever were be before. Um, and think about this. Think about diffi the difficulties that you might go through in, the, in a partnership actually can lead to greater intimacy. Um, and then I would give them tips for how to do self-soothing. By that, I mean, 
everyone's going to be individually more responsible in the, in the couple. It's going to be more responsible for taking care of their own emotions. So some tips that I might talk about is I help them look for larger patterns and meaning in the dilemma. Um, you know, if people can understand why something is going on, sometimes they can calm themselves down. Like if they can make sense of it. So I like this, our organic drive and urges are never separable from the search for meaning and the quest for communion. We, we want to be able to make sense of things. And if we do, we can be a little bit more calm. Uh, I help them understand that you may not be able to choose whether or not you feel anxious, but you do have choices about what to do with that anxiety. A lot of times it's gone so fast, all we're doing with as a clinician is helping things slow down so that they realize there is a moment of decision that comes between an event and the action that we that, that we take. She makes me do this, she, or he makes me uh, uh, whatever. Um, you help them realize that, no, she, she doesn't make you do that, and you have a choice to make. So let's figure out, because there are probably times when you didn't make that choice. So let's try and figure out what was going on then and how, how you were able to do that. Use time out of connection effectively. For example, maybe I would say to someone, you know, you've told me that sometimes you just need a little bit of time to chill down. Sometimes you go over and you talk to your friend and you complain about your partner and what a horrible person she is. And, uh, and that feels good to vent. But uh, when you come back, then you still feel that tension. Other times you've told me you did something different. You went down by the river. You walked along the road. You thought about why it is that you love your partner so much and what you are grateful about the relationship and, and your hopes for where it might go. And when you go back after those times, it seems like you're in a very different place and that things go much better. You know, we're all, all going to do some of both. We're going to do some of the, the negative and some of the positive. But if your long-term goal is to save this relationship and to have greater connection, then I hope you'll, you'll choose to use your time out of, uh, when you're away from one another better. Some of the time I'm trying to help people take it pers not take it personally. It's amazing how personal people may take things that have nothing to do with them. I've said to people like, how did you decide that the fact that he doesn't have an erection is all your fault? Like there are hundreds of reasons why someone might not have an erection. Um, how did you make it about you? Um, or, or some version of that. I've even done some version of that with an affair. Like you were ready to go to a deeper level of, of connection. Uh, and it was during the time that you were having your, your first child. So you were ready for a deeper level, but, uh, but he wasn't. So how did you decide that was about you? You know, I don't do that with everybody, but uh, sometimes I, I, I will use it that way. Okay. Uh, 